on the run from a dishonest record label and a bum contract, today's legendary artist dropped off the grid and he hid out in a dive bar in LA. There under an alias, he spent six months on the down low playing music for down and out crowds. Didn't pay much, there was really no glory in it, but it was a life altering decision. That's because it taught him how to take his song craft to a new level. And it gave him the inspiration to write a signature song of all signature songs. One that would break him into the mainstream. It's a song that generations of fans have turned into a go-to karaoke classic and an essential track for any Saturday night. The story is coming up next, Professor Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember life lessons that you learned during Saturday morning cartoons like this. Maybe your best friend, talking a problem out with someone else can be a great help. You're gonna dig this channel. We also have a Patreon where you get more content, you get honorary mentions on our channel. Helps us to get more interviews. Click on that below. So I'm excited to return to one of my favorite shows we do on this channel. It's called Breakthrough. In this show, we break down songs, albums, or events that kicked open the door to an artist or band's career that gave them the momentum to rocket to uh, long-term success. And today's classic song really could have gone under a lot of monikers or shows that we do on here. The New Standards should have been a number one hit or a number one in our hearts, Breakthrough. Uh, it's a true signature song. Today, we're giving you the story behind Billy Joel's classic, Piano Man, from his 1973 album of the same name. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. So back in 1971, when Billy Joel was just 22, he signed a long-term recording and publishing contract with a label called Family Productions, uh, under the direction of label founder and producer Artie Rip. Joel recorded his first solo offering, Cold Spring Harbor. That included classics like She's Got Away and Everybody Loves You Now. She's got a way about her somehow. But everybody loves you now. However, due to a strange error in the mastering process, uh, the tracks played just a little too quickly and it caused Billy Joel's voice to sound unnaturally high, like a member of Alvin and the Chipmunks, actually. After hearing it for the first time, it's reported the Billy Joel ripped it off of the turntable and he ran out of the house and he threw it down the street. Very angry. Other unwanted edits were made to the album uh, as well as that. But when Billy Joel asked Artie Rip to fix these mistakes, he was told that the label didn't have any more money to spend on this album. Released on November 1st, 1971, Cold Spring Harbor started off as a commercial disaster, a failure, not even placing on the U.S. Billboard albums chart at all. Billy Joel would say that the album tanked because Rip failed to promote it. Rip countered, claiming that he spent $450,000 developing Joel and Cold Spring Harbor, though exactly how he did that is not clear. Artie Rip actually had a pretty bad reputation in the industry, especially from the artist's perspective. Let's just say that uh, more than a few claim that Artie Rip took advantage of them, uh, even extorted them. By the time Billy Joel set out on tour in the fall of 1971, he was just discovering all of this. He did open for bands like Jay Giles' band, uh, Badfinger, and the Beach Boys. However, neither Billy Joel nor his bandmates made any money. Traveling around in a little camper trailer, Joel said, I literally lived on the road for six months and I had a band together and nobody got paid. Cigarette money, you know, and sometimes we'd get meals taken care of, but mostly we actually paid for our own food. We were going, what's going on? Joel was told that his missing paychecks, those were all going to promotion. Now, when you're starting out, you got to pay your dues. I get that. The money comes later. But even if that was true, promotion for Cold Spring Harbor was MIA. Copies of Cold Spring Harbor were non-existent on record store shelves, and Billy Joel's songs were rarely on the radio. They just weren't playing it. Discouraged, it became pretty clear to Billy Joel that Cold Spring Harbor was not going to be a big breakthrough at all. It was a complete failure. What was worse though, is that Billy Joel was locked into a bad contract with Artie Rip and Family Productions. Said Joel of his business arrangement with them, I signed a lot of stupid papers. I signed away my publishing and my copyrights. Sometimes when you're a young artist, you have no idea you're being cheated. 
So after six months of touring, Billy Joel dropped off the grid completely. Uh, he actually fled to California, intent to escape his label. Maybe if they realized that they weren't going to get anything out of him, they just let him out of his contract, let him go. So there on the West Coast, Billy Joel effectively dropped out of the music business altogether. He went underground. He got a job at a Los Angeles piano bar called The Executive Room. There he sang and played under the sort of pseudonym of Bill Martin, similar to his favorite baseball player of the Yankees, Billy Martin. And actually, Martin is uh, Joel's middle name. It was a poor man's wage there, but it was still a step up from what Hardy Rip was paying him. That's crazy. Said Billy about playing the executive room, it was a gig I did for about six months just to pay rent. I was living in LA and I was trying to get out of a bad record contract that I'd signed. I worked under an assumed name, the piano stylings of Bill Martin, and I just BS my way through it. Uh, end of quote. Joel would soon discover that playing music in a bar or restaurant, it's really a thankless task. Far from a concert setting, you do your best to entertain a crowd who could care less about your performance. I mean, best case scenario, customers might briefly emerge from their conversations, drinks, and meals to catch a familiar song, maybe sing along, but most of the time, they're not paying attention at all. Now, as we continue to break down the song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Clear. You know, I've had several amazing experiences with Clear Nasal Spray. I mentioned how uh, it helped me beat a nasty cold some months back. And since then, I got into the habit of washing my nose every morning when I brush and at night. Over the last few weeks, my wife and kids all caught a cold. I avoided it. I know that Clear has made the difference. I'm having them use it now. The key ingredient is xylitol, a natural sugar that blocks bacterial and viral adhesion. We know that we breathe in millions of toxins every day and Clear is the answer. Click on the link below to get yours and make sure to leave us a comment on Amazon to let us know your experience. Start washing your nose today with Clear. So looking back on his time at the executive room, Billy Joel said, I've never in all my tribulations in the music business with lawsuits and ripoffs and endless tours, I've never given myself more than two seconds of self-pity ever since I realized the piano bar gig is something a lot of people have to do for years, maybe for their entire lives. I didn't like doing that job, but it was the only job I was qualified to do. So I have an appreciation of that. Uh, now, Joel undoubtedly found the job tedious. However, the experience, as underwhelming as it was, it proved to be both formative and really essential for Joel's future success as a songwriter. That's because playing piano in a dive bar provided him with the true-to-life material that he needed to write his breakthrough single, Piano Man. Sing us a song tonight well, we're all in Joel, who would later be called by that name, knew exactly what it felt like to be a piano man in this little place. Meanwhile, back east, Billy Joel was about to get an unexpected boost to his career. As it turned out, there was one good thing that came from Cold Spring Harbor, uh, the tour anyway. During the spring of 1972, radio station WMMR in Philadelphia picked up a live recording of Joel's song, Captain Jack. Captain Jack will get you high tonight. Though the song was destined to appear on his sophomore release, uh, Joel had long since written it while living in Long Island. Disc jockey Ed Shockey, a legend, started receiving requests for the track from listeners who had heard the original performance. And over the course of several months, Captain Jack became the most requested track in the history of WMMR, huge radio station. Uh, so it was a huge stroke of luck for him. So the regional success of Captain Jack, that captured the attention of Columbia Records. And actually, executives from Columbia had also already seen Joel play. So they tracked him to California with the intent to sign him. It was just the help that he needed to get out of his bad contract with Family Productions. Actually, by then, Artie Rip was trying to smooth things over with Billy Joel, uh, trying to negotiate a new deal for him with Atlantic Records. But Billy, he was set on recording for Columbia where a lot of his heroes had recorded. That took some legal maneuvering, but Billy Joel finally joined Columbia Records when Artie Ripps sold them uh, his contract. Though he actually had to carry Ripps Family Productions logo uh, on uh, his albums for years after. And 
Oh, yeah, Artie Rip made a killing off the deal. Joel then returned to the studio to record his second album titled Piano Man. Piano Man was recorded at Devonshire Sound in North Hollywood with veteran Michael Stewart producing. But for the recording process, Joel was surrounded by some of the best session musicians on the West Coast. There was uh, Michael Amartian and uh, Jimmy Haskell. They provided the arrangements. Ron Mello engineered, and of course, Billy Joel played all the keyboard parts. Uh, Stewart's approach in the studio it was night and day different from Rip's. The sessions for Cold Spring Harbor were pretty chaotic. You know, Rip frustrating the musicians to no end with excessive takes. In contrast, Stewart proved to be the model of studio efficiency, and everything flowed pretty smoothly. Piano Man, the album, was released by Columbia Records on November 9th of 1973. It was a big leap forward for Billy Joel. While Cold Spring Harbor was largely comprised of self-portraits, Piano Man drew on Joel's experiences at the executive room, you know, shifting his lyrical stylings toward uh, character studies. But growth came not only in terms of musicianship, but also in commercial success as well. Now, Cold Spring Harbor didn't make the Billboard 200 album chart. It actually peaked just below that at 202, uh, the bubbling under LP chart in 72. Uh, contrast that with Piano Man, that soared to number 27 in the US, number 26 in Canada, and it went to number three in Australia. It would take two years, but Piano Man certified gold with over 500,000 copies sold in the US. Years later, it would go multi-platinum, of course, and it's tallied more than 4 million records sold since then. I call that a big breakthrough. Now, two interesting things uh, about this. Number one, when it was a hit, you know, making its way up the chart, everyone actually mistook Billy Joel for Harry Chapin. Everyone thought it was Chapin singing, uh, not Billy Joel. And the cats in the cradle and a silver spoon. And number two, uh, Billy Joel He's worth about a quarter of a billion dollars today, maybe more, maybe less. He reportedly made less than $8,000 off of Piano Man when it was a hit. Wow. For a melody, and you've got a Billy Joel's sophomore solo release included 10 tracks, ending with the aforementioned Captain Jack. It would also uh, spawn four singles, Worst Comes to Worst, uh, Travel and Prayer, Ballad of Billy the Kid, phenomenal song, and today's feature track, Piano Man. Piano borrows, comes to work. Her tonight to make sure that she's gonna be all right until she's home and here with me. The word spread of Billy the Kid. Of course, the one song on this album that Billy will forever be tied to is Piano Man. Uh, came to Joel in a rush of creativity. And if you haven't guessed it already, it's just a, it's a fictional retelling of Joel's time playing the executive room, kind of. All the characters in this iconic song are actually based on people he came to know while he was working there. Uh, for example, Paul, the real estate novelist, was actually a real estate broker and an executive room regular. He always claimed to be working on a book. Now Paul is a real estate novelist. But you know, Billy Joel figured he'd never finish it because he was always at the bar drinking instead of at home writing. Real estate novelist, I love that. It's kind of like Cheers for, the, for LA. Davey, who's still in the Navy, that's reportedly based on a man named David Heinz, whom Joel met in a pub in Spain in 72. And he's talking with David, who's still in the Navy. And uh, the waitress practicing politics, she's Billy Joel's first wife, Elizabeth Weber, actually. And the waitress is practicing politics. And everyone knows a guy like John at the Bar, who Billy refers to as John at the Bar, is a friend of mine. Now John at the Bar is a friend of mine. He gets me my drinks for free. He's quick with a joke or the light of your smoke. Up your smoke. But there's some place that he'd rather be. But there's some place that he'd rather be. He says, Bill, I believe this is killing me, as the smile ran away from his face. He says, Bill, I believe this is killing me. I'm sure that he could be a movie star if I could get out of this place. And describing that person who seems to be stuck in life, far more talented and capable than their current situation, but totally stuck. If I could get out of this place. 
And you know, that kind of makes me think of my dad because my dad was like that. My dad could have been a comedian. He was so funny, but he just didn't have the opportunities. Anyway, just I'm sure that you're thinking of people to uh, let me know in the comments. As simple as it is melodically, Piano Man, it's undeniably captivating. Heavy on the piano and harmonica, Billy Joel regales us over the course of eight verses, in waltz time no less, with tales of uh, tired old men, slowly dying bartenders, as I just said, real estate novelists, Navy lifers, political waitresses, stone businessmen, and above all, a pretty good crowd for a Saturday. It's a pretty good crowd for a Saturday. I mean, it's a cast of unforgettable character studies as ordinary as they come. I mean, it's a love letter to people watching. And as great as a signature song it has a right to be. Oh, and the harmonica, that's a tip to the hat to uh, one of Joel's greatest influences, the great Bob Dylan. The power of Piano Man is that we can see a part of ourselves in each one of these people. They dream, they joke, they live in denial, they're nostalgic and regretful. And they try desperately to forget their troubles, you know, drowning themselves in alcohol for just a little while. Coming to see, to forget about life for a while. We've all been there in one way or another, and that's why we love this song so much and why it resonates 50 years later. I love how Piano Man opens. It sets the stage so perfectly. You can just see it all so clearly in your mind. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday. The regular crowd shuffles in. There's an old man sitting next to me, making love to his tonic and gin. Next to me, making love to his tonic and gin. I mean, before you even through that first verse, you're already immersed in the history of this late night lounge. You're right there watching with the piano man as this cast of misfits stagger through the door. Later in the song, we come to find out that the Piano Man narrator is actually named Bill, presumably Billy Joel in the guise of Bill Martin. It says, Bill, I believe this is killing me. And as he plays the soundtrack to another dive bar Saturday night, we can imagine that all of this must have been a very familiar scene to him. There's no doubt in Piano Man, everyone is searching for something better. That's hard to miss, but maybe what we don't see is the fact that the piano man is really no better off than the rest of this crowd. Even as he watches all these people, all this taking place, he's just as trapped as everyone else is. After all, he's there too playing piano in this dive bar. Not center stage in an arena filled with adoring fans. Not yet, anyway. In my jar and say, man, what are you doing here? As the song's point of view shifts to the piano man himself, we in turn sing along with the crowd. We call out, sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight, we're all in the mood for a melody, and you've got us feeling all right. We think maybe the piano man doesn't have it so bad after all. We're all singing together, we're feeling this energy together. This troubadour extraordinaire, he's helped us all to forget about life for a while. More on that in a second. Uh, Joel, who saw himself as a rock singer, was surprised when Piano Man was chosen as the album's first single, actually. However, it proved to be a career-making decision. Piano Man was Billy Joel's mainstream breakthrough. Uh, peaked at number 25 on the Hot 100, that happened in early 74. On the Cashbox uh, Top 100, it did even better. It reached number 16, and in the Adult Contemporary Chart, it soared all the way to number four. Uh, Piano Man, it would also have the distinction of being the first in a string of 33 Top 40 hits for Billy Joel. Internationally, Piano Man climbed to number 20 in New Zealand, number 14 in Australia and uh, went top 10 in Canada. Even before Piano Man peaked on the Billboard charts, uh, the awards and the accolades started rolling in. The close of 73, Cashbox crowned him Best New Male Artist. Stereo Review Magazine named Piano Man Album of the Year, and Record Trade Magazine Music Retailer dubbed him Male Artist of the Year. I mean, no doubt Billy Joel was on his way at this point. 
when I wore a younger man's clothes. Since his early days, Piano Man has appeared in several movies and TV shows, including a couple of different music videos. He, made, he remade one in the mid 80s, but it's been an ER, Two and a Half Men. So you the Piano Man. Sing us a song. Yeah, give it a rest. 30 Rock. The Ringer, Criminal Minds, Bones, Castle. Bones. Oh, sing us a song, you're the piano man. Just go with it, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. And the Mafia. And Glee. Complete when I wore a younger man's clothes. Piano Man has also been covered by Paul Simon, Garth Brooks. And you got us feeling all right. Tori Amos, Ween. La -da, da -da -da. Ben Folds, Zach Brown Band, OAR, Charlie Puth. There's an old man sitting next to me. Melissa Etheridge, Brian McKnight, Soul Asylum, Bruce Hornsby, Chris Cornell, and Corey Hart did a version. Notably, Elton John, who made a uh, reference to a piano man in his 1971 hit, Tiny Dancer. Piano man. He's teamed up with Billy Joel at least 200 times to play this song together. For a melody, you got us all right. They became friends at that time and have toured together extensively. Uh, one of the best tours ever. Also, another Easter egg, most Billy Joel fans know this, but at the end of the video for his song, You're Only Human Second Wind, which went to number nine in 85, uh, you can catch Billy Joel playing the harmonica phrase from Piano Man after saving a young man from suicide. A little tip of the hat to uh, It's a Wonderful Life there. Sooner or later, you'll feel that momentary kick in. Piano Man was registered with the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. I definitely remember the first time that I heard a Piano Man. It was after I discovered Glass Houses as a little kid. I mean, it was like five years old. My dad showed me the song knowing how much I loved that still rock and roll to me and my life. Even if it's old junk, it's still rock and roll to me. Say anymore, this is my life. And that Billy was my favorite artist ever. Still is. I named my firstborn after him. I remember I looked at the cover of his eight track and you know Billy's head, and I'll be honest, it scared the hell out of me as a kid. I mean, Billy looked like a homicidal maniac. I was mesmerized, and with the song even more so. I immediately told my mom I wanted to take piano lessons. About a year later, I hated piano lessons because I was forced to learn Hot Cross Buns and Fur Elise. I wanted to learn Piano Man. That's why I got into it. I wanted to be Billy Joel. I remember buying the cassette tape of Piano Man with my allowance. I remember <laughs> playing Captain Jack, and my mom walked in just when I was singing that infamous part, your sister's gone out, she's on a date, and uh, you just sit at home and, well, you know. Just sit at home and masturbate. She was horrified. Man, Piano Man is such a strange mix of songs, in a good way. But Piano Man, no matter how many times it's been played, and it's been played a lot, it's still the highlight of a great work. Over time, the image of the Piano Man became something of a burden for Billy Joel, as I said, so many times played. He felt like it pigeonholed him to a style and image that he wanted to move beyond. He actually told Howard Stern in 2014 that he thought it was a decent song. Can you imagine that decent song? But because it doesn't change too much, playing it on the piano, he says it could get really boring. But you know what, it seems like Billy Joel has come to terms with this song and it's massive pop culture success, which he's had quite a few of those. Looking back at Piano Man's legacy as a song, he said, and I quote, I have no idea why that song became so popular. It's like a karaoke favorite. The melody is not very good. It's very repetitious, while the lyrics are like a limericks. I was shocked and embarrassed when it became a hit. But my songs are like my kids. And I look at that song and I think, my kid did pretty well, end of quote. Pretty well? That's an understatement for one of pop music's most self-deprecating humble guys. 
I mean, Piano Man, it's the signature song that signature songs are judged by. It's a true standard in the great American songbook, in the world canon. Stands next to the best, the, the Gershwins, or Cole Porter, or Hoagie Carmichael, or anybody else, their best offerings. La, la, da, 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 da. And it has one of my favorite lines from a song that's ever been written. It's a pretty good crowd for a Saturday, and the manager gives me a smile. And the manager gives me a smile. Because he knows that it's me they've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. They've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. That one always kind of brings a tear to the eye because that describes exactly what Billy Joel and his music has done for me and for you and for everyone, really. Billy Joel is that rare artist that whenever we sing along to his songs, whenever we look at him, we see our own reflection. He is beloved. He is popular music's every man. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Billy Joel and Piano Man, the standard of all standards in the pop canon. What are your memories of this song? What are your memories of uh, Billy Joel, his career? What are some of your favorite songs? Let's have a great discussion. What do some of these character studies remind you of, people that you've known in your life? Uh, just such a great song, no matter how many times it's been played. It's just a sing-along ditty. Um, if you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.